Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diana Frendel, and I'm the Interim Chief Curator at the Vancouver Art Gallery. We are joining you from various homes across the country on behalf of the Vancouver Art Gallery, which is situated within the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. We are delighted to be participating in the unveiling of the new Canada Post stamp series, which is officially launching seven new commemorative stamps today. In just a few minutes, the final stamp, which features a work from the gallery's collection, will be revealed. This is one of many collaborations between Canada Post and the Vancouver Art Gallery, which in the past has featured works by Canadian masters Emily Carr and Jack Shadbolt. To mark this occasion today, we are pleased to welcome our speakers, Jim Phillips, the director of the Stamp Services team at Canada Post, and my colleague Grant Arnold, Audain Curator of BC Art at the Gallery. We'd also like to hear from you. So during our talks, please, we invite you to send in your questions via the Q&A function, which we will answer at the end of the presentation. Jim Phillips joins us from his home in Ottawa, where he is responsible for all of the postage needs at Canada Post, including the special commemorative stamp series. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Jim for a brief history of the project and the much anticipated reveal of the last stamp. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I want to thank the Vancouver Art Gallery for so enthusiastically participating in our virtual unveilings of the stamp issue to mark the 100th anniversary of the first group of seven exhibit. We usually do things a little differently at Canada Post, but this is definitely an innovative way to deal with a difficult situation. Through our iconic stamp program, we at Canada Post take great pride in being Canada's storyteller. Through stamps, we ensure that Canadians remain aware and are proud of the people, the milestones, the achievements, and the events that make Canada the great country that it is. Our Stamp Advisory Committee, a group of 12 historians, artists, designers, and philatelists, help us to choose the stories and the stamp designs that make up our annual program. I want to point out that the Vancouver Art Gallery's Ian Tom was instrumental in helping our Stamp Advisory Committee come to their decisions about this stamp set. More than a year ago, Ian, along with Charles Hill, created a very short list of the group's work to be presented to our stamp committee. That list was the starting point for this stamp set. So thank you very much, Ian and Charles. I would also like to thank uh, my stamp team in Ottawa, especially Joy Parks and Liz Wong, who worked a long time on this stamp set to get it exactly the way you're going to see it soon. Um, as Canada's storyteller, we know that it's impossible to tell the story of Canadian art without telling the story of the Group of Seven. Lauren Harris once said, we were told quite seriously that there would never be a Canadian art because we had no art tradition. But the Group of Seven built that tradition. Their work gave Canadians and others around the world a new way to view our landscape, to see the country as it really, as it really was, raw, unspoiled, and full of rough beauty. From the group's unique way of seeing our country, a legacy was born, one that continues to support and nurture our artists. The work of the Group of Seven is not just deeply entrenched in our country's story, it's also played a huge role in how Canada Post reflected images of Canada to Canadians and others around the world. The very first painting by a Group of Seven member to appear on a Canadian stamp was Isle of Spruce by Arthur Linsmer. That was in 1970. 50 years ago, and it was issued to mark the 50th anniversary of the first exhibit. My bosses seem to think I started working at Canada Post then, though I'm not sure why. Over the years, another 16 group of seven paintings would grace our stamps, including 10 stamps honoring both founding members and the three artists who would later join, issued in 1995 to mark the 75th anniversary of this very important group. Lauren Harris proved his critics wrong. Canada has an art tradition built on the legacy of the Group of Seven, one that has evolved into a strong and dynamic art community initiated by that very first show a century ago. And that's what brings us here today. Uh, so now let's have a look at what took place earlier across the country when virtual stamp unveilings took place with all our partner galleries. Each gallery unveiled their stamps on various social channels throughout the day. And tomorrow, the McMichael Canadian Art Collection will host a very special 100th anniversary virtual event. It all kicked off fittingly this morning at the Art Gallery of Ontario, where we unveiled Miners Houses Glace Bay by Lauren Harris. 
The AGO, known in 1920 as the Art Gallery of Toronto, was the location of the group's very first exhibit. Then we moved on to the University of Toronto, where we unveiled Labrador Coast by A.Y. Jackson, part of the Hart House collection, and now on loan as part of a 100th anniversary show at the Rooms in St. John's, Newfoundland. Then we moved to the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, where we unveiled Stormy Weather, Georgian Bay by Frederick Barley and Fire Swept Algoma by Frank Johnson, which was one of the three paintings the, Natural Gal the National Gallery purchased at that very first show in 1920. From there, we went to the Agnes Etherton Arts Center at Queen's University in Kingston, and we unveiled Arthur Lismere's Quebec Village, a gift from H.S. Southern. Then finally to the Ottawa Art Gallery, where we unveiled In the Nickel Belt by Franklin Carmichael from the Firestone Collection of Canadian Art. And that brings us here today to Vancouver for the final unveiling. Thank you very much for hosting us here today. Great, thank you, uh, Jim. That's provide, providing us with that overview and background. Looks like it's been a busy day. And it's actually, it's quite fantastic to see how committed Canada Post is to featuring Canadian artists and artworks on the stamps. And speaking of the artwork, we are fortunate to have Grant Arnold with us today from the gallery. Grant has curated countless thematic exhibitions and artist retrospectives. He has a deep and thoughtful knowledge of the gallery's collection, which is visible in his recently organized exhibition, Rapture Rhythm and the Tree of Life, Emily Carr and her female contemporaries. This presents an expanded account of the context in which modernism developed on the Canadian West Coast. But today Grant is joined us to share a few words on the modernist, J.E.H. MacDonald and the artwork Church by the Sea. Thank you, Grant. Uh, thanks, Diana. Um, uh, maybe I'll start off by uh, saying that I'm very deeply grateful to uh, be on the uh, traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam and Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, and that I'm profoundly grateful for the opportunity to live and work here as an uninvited guest. Uh, so the painting uh, we're about to look at and that I'll discuss uh, is a painting by J.H. MacDonald titled Church by the Sea. It was painted in 1924. It's an oil on canvas painting. It's about 57 by 70 centimeters. So it's an easel painting. It was a fairly common size that MacDonald worked with. Uh, and like uh, much of the Group of Seven's work, this particular picture opens on to narratives relating to the development of modernist painting in Canada and the institutional support and opposition it faced during the 1920s and 30s. Uh, I'll start off with a bit of biographical detail about the artist. J.H. MacDonald was born in Durham, England in 1873 to a Canadian father and English mother. He moved with his family to Hamilton, Ontario in 1887 and began his formal training in art as a teenager at the Hamilton School of Art and later continued studies at the Central Ontario School of Art and Design in Toronto, where his teachers included George Reed and William Cruikshank. Uh, and I should note that uh, his training also included uh, graphic design as well as uh, 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 landscape and portrait painting. MacDonald took a job as a graphic designer with the Toronto design firm The Grip in 1895, and uh, he subsequently worked for a few other firms, but eventually became Grip's head designer in 1907. And Grip was a really important meeting ground for the artists who would later form the Group of Seven. During his time at Grip, MacDonald met Franz Johnson and Tom Thompson, who joined the firm as designers in 1908. Franklin Carmichael, who was quite a bit younger than MacDonald, uh, was hired uh, as an office boy in 1911. Arthur Lismer came from England to join the firm as a designer that same year. And uh, Fred Varley came from England to join the firm as a designer in the following year. MacDonald left Grip in 1911 and he moved to Thornhill to focus on landscape painting. Uh, though in order to make a living, he continued to do freelance design work into the 1920s. Lauren Harris first became aware of MacDonald's painting when an exhibition of MacDonald's sketches was mounted at the Arts and Letters Club in Toronto in 1912. And so the photograph we're looking at now was made in the Arts and Letters Club. It has six uh, members of the group of seven, uh, 
McDonald is the one at the far right. And maybe as a little bit of an aside, um, you know, the, over the last 35 years or so, there's been a, a great deal of discussion around uh, the question of gender in the group of seven. The group of seven uh, were, of course, all men. And it's interesting looking at this picture because all of the figures in it are men. The Arts and Letters Club was a, a really uh, important site where uh, art culture were debated, uh, but not like other clubs at the time, women weren't allowed to be members and were often excluded from the space. Uh, so to return back to Harris and McDonald, uh, Harris was very impressed with McDonald's work. Uh, they had a shared interest in theosophy and a shared interest in the writings of Henry David Thoreau and Walt Whitman and their discussions of the possibility of transcendence in the experience of nature. Uh, and Harris quickly became uh, a staunch supporter of McDonald's work and they became very close friends. One of the seminal moments that's uh, usually told in, uh, that led up to the formation of the Group of Seven came in January of 1913, when McDonald and Harris traveled to Buffalo to see an exhibition of Scandinavian landscape painting that included the works of artists like Harold Solberg and Henrik Feistad at the Albright Knock Gallery. And commenting later on this encounter, McDonald noted that, quote, except in minor points, the pictures might all have been Canadian, and we felt this is what we wanted to do in Canada, end quote. Uh, in particular, Harris and McDonald were interested in the Scandinavian use of intense color, evocative lighting, and their attention to, quote, untamed, unquote, landscapes that seemed to extend beyond the bounds of human domestication. This approach suggested a more direct contract, contact with nature uh, that offered greater possibilities than the pastoral landscapes rendered in soft, hazy tones that were favored by Canadian collectors and many artists at the time. MacDonald and his colleagues' pursuit of an identifiably Canadian approach to modern painting was largely suspended at the advent of the Great War. Varley and Jackson became official war artists and Harris enlisted in the army. At the war's conclusion, uh, the seven artists who had formed the group, MacDonald, Harris, Jackson, Johnston, Lismer, Varley, and Carmichael, reunited and often traveled together to the Algoma and Muskoka regions of Ontario, making landscape sketches and experimenting with techniques that could be worked into larger scale paintings in their Toronto studios. By 1919, they had decided to form a group devoted to a distinctly Canadian approach to modernism, and at this point began to refer to themselves as the Group of Seven. As you all know, uh, the Group of Seven mounted their initial exhibition at the Art Gallery of Toronto in 1920, and their work was exhibited regularly, often with artists from outside the group, over the following 12 years. McDonald's death, and McDonald was the oldest member of the group, his death in 1932 was one of the factors that led to the dissolution of the Group of Seven and its succession by the less nationalistic Canadian group of painters in 1933. In addition to his activities as an artist, MacDonald an, played an important role as an educator. He joined the faculty of the Ontario College of Art and Design in 1921, and he became principal of the college in 1928. And he was a very eloquent advocate of the Group of Seven's ideals in his lectures and his extensive writing. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. Sorry, can we move to the, the great. Church by the Sea, which we're looking at here, had its origins in a 1922 trip MacDonald made to Nova Scotia to visit a friend in Petite Riviere. He stayed there for a month and produced a number of sketches, some of which he later worked into larger paintings on canvas like this one. Some of the accounts of this visit uh, mention that the experience of being by the ocean uh, reminded MacDonald of his uh, childhood in England, uh, where he would often uh, view the English Channel and the North Sea. <clears throat> Um, and many of the accounts uh, of these works uh, describe his paintings as being serene in comparison to the Algoma paintings he'd done a bit earlier. But I'm not sure that that term ap applies to this particular picture. Uh, the intense and somber color in it, for me, evokes a sense of austerity rather than serenity. There were certain aspects of this work that link up to the larger ideals of the Group of Seven. The church, for example, is a kind of symbol of the individual who's shaped by the severity of the landscape. The church is a kind of metaphor for the link between the earth and the heavens. The rhythm of the landscape is implied in the rocks and you see in the foreground. And this question of rhythm was something that was discussed very regularly about the Group of Seven's work. Uh, Fred Hauser, in a book he wrote on them in, 19, in the mid-1920s, talked about how 
uh, what was essential to this, their work is the way the rhythm of the landscape imposed itself on their consciousness. Um, and the expanse of ocean that we see behind the church implies uh, 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 the infinite or connection with the infinite. Um, it's interesting that he uh, also produced a print of this work in the following year, 1925, uh, in addition of 100. Um, and this was a fairly common practice of the, of the Group of Seven, and there was a real sense that they needed to make their work accessible to a broad public. So that included at times making prints, which were obviously sold at a much lower cost than the paintings. Um, and uh, in Vancouver during the 1920s, uh, there wasn't an art gallery. Um, but nonetheless, the National Gallery, for example, regularly sent exhibitions would have included the work of the Group of Seven, which were presented in conjunction with events like the Pacific National Exhibition. Uh, so these were exhibitions that were, uh, the tradition was that they marked the conclusion of the harvest. So, uh, and they were very conscious of making this work uh, accessible or viewable by a broad public, uh, which is a very conscious strategy. So uh, uh, that's something to kind of keep in mind as we're looking at this painting, that it was part of this kind of larger way of reaching out to a broad Canadian public. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Sorry, this is a portrait uh, by uh, Emma Hammond of J.H. MacDonald, uh, made uh, 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 two years before his death. Uh, and so maybe we'll go to the next slide as well, please. Church by the Sea was donated to the Vancouver Art Gallery in 1941 by Harold Mortimer Lamb, a British-born mining engineer and journalist who came to Vancouver in 1889, moved to Montreal in 1903 to take a position as secretary of the Canadian Mining Institute, and returned to Vancouver in 1920. What we're looking at is a portrait of Mortimer Lamb painted by uh, Frederick Varley, one of the founding members of the group, who uh, in the late 20s and 30s was living in Vancouver. <clears throat> Uh, while in Montreal, Mortimer Lamb met a number of important uh, Canadian painters, including A.Y. Jackson. For a time, he was the Montreal correspondent for an English art journal called The Studio. And in that journal, he supported the work of artists like Jackson and their ideals in the years before the formation of the Group of Seven. Mortimer Lamb was also an accomplished pictorialist photographer. He was a friend of uh, the New York photographer and gallerist Alfred Stieglitz. And Stieglitz uh, published some of Mortimer Lamb's work in his journal. <clears throat> camera work. Uh, Mortimer Lamb was also the father of Molly Lamb Bobak, who became widely known as a Canadian painter during the second half of the 20th century. And for a short time, he was the co-proprietor of a gallery on Robson Street in Vancouver with the photographer John Vanderpan. After the Vancouver Art Gallery opened in 1931, he served on the gallery's acquisitions committee, which was known then as the Purchase and Acceptance Committee, but he was often at odds with the other members of the committee over their hostility toward modern Canadian art. So the acquisitions committee, the gallery really actively uh, avoided acquiring uh, work by monitors like the Group of Seven or Emily Carr even. Um, although due to pressure by uh, Mortimer Lamb, they did acquire one work by the group, a painting of a Quebec scene by A.Y. Jackson fairly early on. <clears throat> uh, Mortimer Lamb, uh, he purchased this painting from uh, McDonald's son, Thoreau McDonald, in 1933, the year after McDonald's death and the year in which the Canadian group of painters succeeded the group of seven. Uh, I should say this painting, uh, The Church by the Sea, uh, was included in a memorial exhibition organized by the Royal Canadian Academy in 1933, which is interesting because for much of their uh, span of the group of seven, they were really at odds with the Academy, which favored a kind of more, uh, uh, conservative approach to painting. And so the fact that they ordered this retros organized this retrospective exhibition indicates a kind of reconciliation of those differences. Um, so uh, Mortimer Lamb acquired the painting after the year after McDonald's death. In the letter, so we'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, in the letter, uh, Mortimer Lamb, who although he was financially comfortable, he wasn't unaffected by the Great Depression. Um, sent to Thoreau MacDonald confirming his purchase is indicative of his long-standing support of the Group of Seven and his view of the Vancouver Art Gallery's collecting activity in the years immediately following its opening. So just read what you see on the screen there. I'll read it out loud. Dear Mr. MacDonald, thanks so much for securing me the privilege of acquiring Church by the Sea. 
the price placed on the picture was most reasonable, and if I could have afforded to pay it, I would not have hesitated. Still, it is not every day that one has an opportunity to buy an example of your father's work, of which I am an enthusiastic admirer. And so regardless of economic circumstances, I decided to wire you the offer you have been good enough to accept. If my circumstances presently improve, I should very much to like to possess a companion work. There is a possibility that the Vancouver Art Gallery may buy warm autumn in the Rockies. If, however, they don't, I shall be grateful if you will provide me the opportunity to buy it a little later on. My intention is to leave my collection to the Vancouver Art Gallery, and I have already made a provision in my will to that effect. They don't deserve to be given anything but junk, as that's what appeals to the taste of the powers that be and determines their buying possibility. So you know, obviously get a sense that Mortimer Lamb here is rather unhappy with the gallery's collecting activity. But by 1941, that collecting activity had changed and modernist work by artists such as Emily Carr had begun to enter the collection. And with this development, Mortimer Lamb's view of the gallery also changed. And rather than waiting for his death, he gifted Church by the Sea, along with several other works, including a sketch by, Harold Moore, uh, by Arthur Lismer and the portrait that we just saw earlier by Fred Varley. So he gifted those to the gallery at the same time. And these were really important additions to the gallery's small but now expanding collection of contemporary Canadian art. So I'll conclude there. Great, great. That's great. Thank you so much, Grant, um, for that very informative background on not only MacDonald, but also Mortimer Lamb and his relationship to the gallery. It's, um, it's also particularly interesting to have your insight into the church that is depicted in the painting. And just, I would also like to make a, an announcement that you can see this work um, in person at the gallery, Church by the Sea, will be included in upcoming exhibition, You Are One of Us, Emily Carr and the Group of Seven, which will be curated by Ian Tom, the Senior Curator Emeritus at the gallery. And it's scheduled to open at the gallery in fall, November this year. And on that note, I would also now like to open up to our friends in the media and our members and guests tuning in today. And just a reminder that if you have any questions, you can send them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your window. And please do indicate if you'd like to address these questions to anyone in particular. So I did, um, maybe I'll just uh, start up here because I did have one question that was asked um, about when they would go on sale, the, the stamps. So, um, I believe, Jim, you mentioned they're on sale from tomorrow? Correct. The stamps go on sale tomorrow morning. Um, that would be the exact day, the 100th anniversary of that first exhibit that took place in Toronto. Those stamps will be available at CanadaPost.ca on our online store. Um, and I would encourage everyone to get them because I think uh, that um, I've been watching the comments and going by, and I think it's going to be quite a, a good... Uh, um, interest in these stamps and they are commemorative stamps that means it's only a limited run so I would encourage people if they want to get them to get them very soon our online store is open and um, and we're ready to deliver right and we will also be carrying these in the gallery as well I believe so um, so when we do reopen then people can visit the gallery and and um, also purchase from the gallery store so is there is there any special cancel to is um, I was asked a question here from Laura, uh, Laura terms. Is there a special cancel to send away for? Uh, yes, so um, there are actually seven official first day covers. Those are all going to be unveiled uh, tomorrow. Anybody wants they can log in uh, at McMichael uh, their event. They're going to be unveiling uh, virtually all seven of those official first day covers, one for each of the artists um, and one featuring a stamp for each of the paintings we've just seen and you see here on the screen. Um, and each of the, there, so there's seven different cancels, one for each first day cover, all of them relating to the artist, either where the artists were born or if they weren't born in, in Canada, a, a unique place um, where they were born. And anyone who knows how to get those cancels can get them from the National Philatelic Center for 60 days after uh, tomorrow. Yeah, they'll be available. Uh, great, great, that's very good. Um, Grant, I have one here that uh, just popped away here. Um, did McDonald ever visit BC and paint here? 
Um, he he uh, might have visited the, uh, yes, he did visit the province. Um, he regularly traveled to the Rockies um, in the mid 20s and regularly uh, went to L Lake O'Hara, which is a, uh, the lake that's on the other side of the mountain that's behind Lake Louise. Um, and so he did uh, a paint in the Rockies in BC uh, quite regularly. He, he did, his Lake O'Hara paintings are quite well known. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Um, I think that's all the questions here. And we are, um, because this is a media preview, if there are any, oh, here we go. One last one, if I ask here. Um, is there any theme for the art selection of this 100th anniversary? So, Jim, do you know, was, were there any uh, particular thematics that the, um, the jury members were asked to, to select from, or? Well, so as I mentioned earlier, um, Ian Tom and um, Charlie Hill helped us out. Um, and the criteria was we were celebrating the group of seven and the kickoff was that first exhibit that took place 100 years ago in Toronto um, at what is now the AGO. Uh, so, you know, initially as a stamp advisory committee looked at, well, maybe they should be all paintings from that exhibit. And then we started talking to the experts and, and saying, well, then you're going to be leaving out some of their better known paintings. And really, we're celebrating the, the 100th anniversary. It just so happens to kick off of that exhibit. But really, this is meant to be the 100th anniversary of the group of seven. So um, then we wanted to look at, well, we featured, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of stamps from the Group of Seven already. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of different stamps over the years, either in the Masterpieces of Canadian Art series or in celebrating the Group of Seven's uh, 50th and 75th anniversary. So right away, we ruled out anything that had already been on a Canadian stamp. Uh, and that's something we do all the time when we, when we issue stamps. And then with the experts, we wanted to look at across Canada representation. We didn't all want it to be Northern Ontario. We wanted to see, so that's what you're seeing here in front of you. You're seeing things from, from uh, different coasts and Rockies. And, and then of course, um, we wanted them to be kind of, it just held together if they're all landscapes. Um, and uh, so, it, so some of that criteria was in place. And then all of that short list went to the Canadian Stamp Advisory Committee and then they debated over it long and for a long time on, on what they should be and what they should look like and how they work together as a set of seven. So that's kind of, if, uh, if, if that's what you're asking. So that was the, that was the Canada Post criteria on, on the anniversary. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, I also was asked who the designer of this particular series was. Oh, the, the designer is um, Lionel Gadbury from uh, Context Creative in Toronto. He's one of our, um, oh, he's a really good designer. He's done Haunted Canada, which was a three-year series, really interesting. Uh, Gardenia, uh, Hanukkah, Toronto Maple Leafs, 100th anniversary, uh, Lunar New Year, Year of the Rooster. So Context Creative uh, is the ones who have designed uh, these stamps for us. Oh, great. Great. Thank you. Um, and I imagine you can find that and much more about these stamps on the website, canadapost.ca. Absolutely. All that information is there, the quantity, the designers, the, uh, everything is there. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, and I think this feels like the right time to wrap up today's preview. So again, I would like to uh, send a generous um, thank you to our speakers for joining us today and to all of you um, for joining us in this media preview. And as Jim has said, you can find out more about the stamp and the series and also uh, purchase your own set online tomorrow at canadapost.ca. And if you would like to find out more about the gallery and our upcoming exhibitions and our ongoing virtual offerings, you can do so at vanartgallery.bc.ca. And just a reminder that every Tuesday at 1.30 and Friday at 4.30, we do stream live talks and performances on Art Connects. And every other Wednesday at 1.30 p.m., we introduce a new art activity on Art at Home. You can find out what's coming up and register online on our website. And once again, that's vanartgallery.bc.ca. So thank you everyone for tuning in and until we meet again, stay home, stay safe and stay creative. <laughs>